Patrick Christie's here at Westminster. I'm joined today by Bim Afalami, Tory MP for Hitchin and Harpenden. Thank you very much for joining me today, Bim. Thank you. Um, you're a new MP, you're young, you're fresh. It seems only fitting we should talk about the future of the, of the Tory party. So what's your assessment of where the Tory party's at now? Because I, I think from the outside perspective, it, it might look a little bit weary. Well, I think that it's, you've got to be honest, and the election campaign was a bit of a shock for us. Yeah. Um, and I think that, again, we've got to be honest and realise that the party's sort of stuck between two positions now. We are obviously going through Brexit mm. and the Cabinet and the Prime Minister are leading that process with David Davis. But also there's the domestic agenda. And mm. in the manifesto, um, much derided now, but actually, in my view, actually had some pretty important things in it. Yeah. Um, the Prime Minister signalled a change of direction in certain ways. Obviously, we spoke about social care, but there's also technical education, the introduction of T levels. We've also got the rebalancing of the economy, various other things that actually, and the industrial strategy, of course, being, mm. uh, being key as well. Those things, in my view, need to now really get pushed. Now, I think there are several people in the party, l partly because of the... The, the poor performance at the election, yeah. who are not as keen on the manifesto as other people. Uh, and, and so I think the Conservative Party is really going through this process of really working out what the next stage and direction is in terms of domestic policy. And I've, I focus on that, notwithstanding the obvious importance of Brexit. Yeah, and so I think, would you agree that at the minute maybe there is a difficulty in the Conservative Party un under May kind of portraying, getting their message across to people, especially younger voters? And, and why do you think that is and, and what can maybe be done about that, do you think? So, so I, I put this into two brackets. You've first of all got a, what you might call a branding or an image thing mm. with younger voters, and then you've got a policy aspect to it. If you talk about the image and branding first, look, it's, it, it was... It was always the case that Jeremy Corbyn, even in his most unpopular days, did have a kernel of support yeah. from sort of young people within the Labour Party on the left of politics. What we saw in the campaign was that he turned himself into the main protester against the government. Mm. Um, previously in elections, we've had UKIP, the Lib Dems, various other parties who were all protest parties who picked up different protest votes. This election, the Labour Party was the protest party. And so, Anybody who wanted to vote against something found a ready vehicle for that in Jeremy mm. Corbyn. Now, why is that relevant in terms of young voters? There are a lot of things for young people to be angry about. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Now, mm. we can talk about housing, we can talk about uh, earnings, we can talk about university fees, there are various other yeah, aspects to that. I think they're the biggest ones. And so if you have a situation where young people are angry, and then you have somebody who is the big protester against the government. And has got he's really good at protesting. He's basically been protesting well, against every government for yeah. the last 30 years. Then there's no surprise that that, that can get some support. Now, and I think that that in br political branding terms was obviously a case. And I think the way to deal with that is to make sure that you are exciting, dynamic and innovative and different and with a real program to improve people's lives with a positive vision, which I think we can do. Um, and I think we're going through that process now. In relation to the substantive policy elements of that, the party is acutely aware that on these issues of housing, tuition fees, earnings, jobs, we're going to have to present a positive, pro mm. positive program. A and we know that. We've got to do it. What I think, and I think that the ban of Uber the other day by TfL and supported by the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, shows me that the Labour Party is on the wrong side of the future in this sense. The number of young people who run their own businesses, who especially whether it be tech-enabled businesses, mm. internet businesses, they do not see Uber as the enemy. They might recognise that black cabs have got some legitimate grievances, as I do. The way to respond to that is to lower the regulation on black cabs to make them cheaper, mm. not to ban competition, yeah. which makes everybody's life more expensive and, and di more difficult. So I think that just shows us that Labour are on the wrong side of the future in terms of entrepreneurship, innovation, and that's the sort of agenda that I think the Conservative Party should be pushing. And I think it's a natural, I mean, history tells us, doesn't it, that after any extended period of time in power, there needs to be some kind of necessary kind of shedding of skin, I suppose, of kind of rising, from, rising from the ashes, of present of, presenting of a new vision, maybe, a new a new kind of party almost, a new branding thing as, as you've touched on. I mean, does that, does that mean that things have to change at the top of the Tory party, do you think? Well, in terms what, of being, in terms of the, uh, for the next election, I mean. Yeah, look, so what I think is clear, and I, and I think this is a really important point that I think people have forgotten. Think about how different 
the Conservative Party's preoccupations are and issues are now than they were when David Cameron was in charge. Mm. David Cameron didn't leave that long ago. Yeah. <laughs> and look at the change. Now, some of that change has been stylistic. The Prime Minister is obviously a very different personality from, the, from David Cameron, and that's obvious. But also, it's been policy-based. The things that I was discussing yeah. earlier, in policy terms, they're, they're quite different. Cameron was an exceptional leader of the party, you know, in many ways. I joined the party when, you know, when he was leader. But a lot of those concerns were more metropolitan concerns. I think that the Prime Minister is quite rightly tapped into a lot of discontent that's happening in places that frankly have been left behind that are that mm. are not very metropolitan either in the London or the South East and I think that that is important and I think that the policy drivers to improve that and to work on those things are what we need to now do over the next few years and yes I, I you know I'm not avoiding your question to get to the nub of it you know does 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 leadership have to change I think leadership does change but leadership doesn't literally mean the leader leadership mm. means the direction of the party, the people, the main spokesman of the party on the key policy areas. I think it's undoubted over the next few years that, that those things are going to change. And I think as well, the Cabinet at times has, has maybe done the party slight disservice, it's seemed disjointed at times. And is that something that you would you would urge them to unite or would you maybe change personnel? I don't know. What, what would your position well, be on I, that? To be, to be perfectly blunt, I think that the, the Cabinet does need to really get behind and um, not just, I mean, the Cabinet is behind the Prime Minister, but really show like yeah. they are in the public. And part of this is the fault of journalists. And I, they've got a job to do, but you know, highlighting a lot of differences which, which may not actually really be there substantively. But all I'd say is, let's show the public that actually on the vast, vast majority of areas, the Conservative Party is united. And we need to just row in the same direction, make, those, make that case positively, whether it be on economic policy, on social policy, on the industrial strategy. Actually, the party's sort of united on that. Let's take social care, mm. which caused a huge amount of controversy in the campaign, quite understandably. Actually, most people in the Conservative Party, if not all people in the Conservative Party, recognise we need to radically improve social care. This is something that is a fundamental issue. We hear it all the time on the doorstep. Everybody understands there's something that needs to be dealt with. Let's row in the same direction. Let's get together and make the positive case to the public. And just uh, before we move on to Brexit, one last one domestically, as it were, I think if there was an election tomorrow, let's just say, if there wasn't actually the next couple of days, you know, if nothing changes with the Tories now, do you, do you think they could win? I think, to be honest, if there was an election tomorrow, um, give or take 10, 20 seats that are very, very yeah. marginal, I suspect the result would, would be relatively similar. Yeah. Um, so I don't think that we're in some sort of uh, downward spiral. Yeah. You've got to forget, the Conservative Party got 43.5% of the vote which is huge yeah. by British standard. We haven't seen that for a very long time, I think since 1987. Yeah. So it's important not to throw the baby out of the bathwater bath and, and think that everything's a disaster. It definitely isn't. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we will see. Yes, and so with regards to Brexit, then obviously we saw Theresa May give her, give her landmark speech in Florence, and then we had Tusk kind of stand on the steps of Downing Street yesterday and say not enough sufficient progress had, had been made. And what's your take on that? What should happen now, do you think, with regards to the comments that Tusk has made? Because they don't really seem like they're particularly bothered about engaging with us, do they, the Europeans now? Look, I, I, I think that we've got to recognise, and I don't know if enough people do, that this is a political battle on mm. some level and a lot of people in the European Union were very upset by Britain's choice to leave and they're not feeling particularly warm towards us. Mm. I think that the Prime Minister with her Florence speech, we all saw the tone of it, the fact that it was in Florence, the real positive way in which she's engaged with Europe and I think that is making a difference. From what I hear, we're also doing that very much privately, mm. behind the scenes, really making a positive case of them saying we want to be your friends we want a special partnership let's do that together hopefully that will start to sort of change the the emotional um, response to this but we've got to be honest and recognize that this is going to be difficult and anybody who thought it would be easy to get sort of to leave the EU and have a special partnership I don't think was thinking properly this is going to be difficult I suspect that the Europeans may be quite difficult for quite a long time yet um, we've got till March 2019 before the, hopefully the transition period kicks in for, for two years. You know, I don't think this will necessarily change in the next couple mm -hmm. of weeks. I just think we've got to keep making the positive case, keep being positive and hope that they recognise that it's in, not in their interest and not in our interest 
to, to, to have a rupture that is, mm. that is destructive. So there was a poll today that, that came out, YouGov did a poll, that yeah. asked them um, how well do you think the government's handling Brexit? And yeah. there was actually 2% said very well, which is it's a bit of a shock, obviously, because that poll <laughs> included right. some Conservative votes, you would assume. I mean, well, why do you think that is? Do you think it's that they're not seeing what's going on behind the scenes? Do you think, well, why is the, the message not maybe getting across that it's being handled that well, do you think? Because most of what happens in a negotiation like that happens in secret. Yeah. It happens in private. It needs to. Yeah. Um, it's going to be very difficult for the public over the next few months to see that this is going this is going well i think we've got to just gird our loins and and understand that the important thing however is what the prime minister and the government says in public about what our intentions are i think the prime minister and government have been very clear about that we need to keep being clear about that communicate with mps and of course we've got when we get back after party conference season there's a lot of sort of legislative activity around mm. the, the repeal bill and various other bills. Um, so, so be positive in public, show the public what we're trying to do. And by the end of the process, when all is revealed, then the public can make the judgment. But, mm. you know, one thing, I'm a huge fan of political history. I, I spend my whole time, you know, when I have time, yeah. reading about <laughs> it. And, you know, people make judgments on the basis of the results you achieve. You know, if you look at Thatcher's election victories, midterm, Thatcher was routinely 20 points down mm. on a pretty unreformed Labour Party. And she won convincingly each time because by the time it came to the election, the public could see what the results were of her activity. And I think that on Brexit, like anything else, we've got to focus on the results. Yes, communicate, but realise that the judgment's going to come on the back of what we actually produce. And just, just lastly, really, um, I've spoke to a couple of MPs who think they mm. might, have a, might have a little bit of a tough time selling on the doorstep this transitional Brexit because they think people expected uh, things to, to maybe come to a, to a very definite end yeah. uh, in March 2019. Yeah. So where do you stand on it? Do you, do you think that we, we need it? Do you think that it's something that we should be offering? Do you think you'll have a hard time selling it to, to your electorate? So do we need it? Um, <laughs> I think so, yeah. because I think and I know just from my own personal conversations with, with business leaders that it's going to be very difficult for us to be, be ready in time for the administrative and bureaucratic things that are required to leave the EU. So I think we do need it. Um, will we get it? I don't know. I hope so. And I think that the Europeans recognise that and they've been quite positive about the transition in, in public. So hopefully that is, that's going to happen. And then the third point as to how to sell it. Well, the only conversations that I've had with, with voters about it are either, you know, we didn't want to leave. So, well, yeah. so, for, so, for, yeah. so for those voters, then frankly, it's, it's quite, everything to do with Brexit is quite difficult. But for those who did vote for Brexit, they want it done right. Mm. You know, it, you, you, we've got to do these things properly. It, you, you can't, because of political impatience, sort of do something which is damaging to the country. So the government has judged an overwhelming support around, around government that a transition period is necessary. Mm. Let's get behind that. Let's get it done right. And then I think we'll all be better for it. I know I said lastly, but I do really mean it this time. But do you think, <laughs> do you think, do you think at the next election, when the next election yeah. comes around, whenever that is, do you think we'll see a different Tory party going into that election? Yes. In what sense do you think? Well, because I think that we will not make the mistakes we made last time mm. around the communication of some of the policies in the campaign. And I also think that we're going to more clearly articulate the new direction in which mm. the country's going to go post-Brexit. I mean, what we also shouldn't forget is this last election was really a Brexit election that turned into one about things that weren't Brexit. Mm. And as a result, it was very messy. It was quite difficult. The messages were quite muffled. Next time, that won't be the case. We'll have left the EU. And then the focus will quite rightly be on who do you want to take you to the public, it'll be which party do you want to take you into the next five, ten years? Or which person, pretty... maybe, I suppose. Is that the issue, do you think? Well, or... well, and, and person, of course, you can't divorce the two. Yeah. Um, so which party and, and leader do you want to take you to the next five, ten years? And I'm pretty sure that if Jeremy Corbyn's leading the Labour Party, that is not going to be, the answer is not going to be Jeremy Corbyn. One thing that I think is worth remembering, despite, frankly, the difficulties the government's had over mm. the last few months, Polling still says Theresa May is preferred as Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister. Still. Jeremy Corbyn's ratings from the sort of reasonable high they got by the election day mm. are now back 
to not far off where they were before the election. Mm. The public has sort of, you know, has reverted back to what they knew about Jeremy Corbyn, which is he's unsuitable. It's our job to make sure that they can make a positive choice for us next time. And that's what I'll be working with my colleagues to try and do. Ben, thank you very much. Thank you.